for all kinds of services um, without heavy burden and without creating that staff seems plausible from an engineering perspective. I mean, it wouldn't look like the current network, I understand. Um, the, the FCC has recognized that also, so we are required to fund the dark fiber companies to customers, uh, CLEX and such as they want. And so uh, there are some restrictions involved with it, and we have to write in into the intervention agreements and whatnot. But the FCC requires us to do so. If companies were you know, forced to share their infrastructure, then how could the companies invest in the infrastructure? <coughs> Uh, so the notion is that to say it's a um, it's it's a public infrastructure question. It's not a private investor question. That if we're coming to a place as a state that we think everybody needs capabilities, that that collectively or individually your investors are not creating, and this seems to characterize the uh, the countries that have leapt ahead have not waited for a private investment to decide we can make this investment and we can make our money back in a time in a timely manner relative to buying Apple stock or and the question electronic art stock or whatever it may be. And the question would be raised then who will have to pay for it? Well I, I'm trying to get business. to the end game first right. and see if we kind of have any consensus on an end game because um, in our discussions with the federal task force earlier um, their notion was that, in general, the hardest part of the problem is getting from where we are, a historic ILEC, CLEC environment where you've had heavy burdens placed on you, you know, admittedly, but how do we, how do we make that right? You know, if we think there's competition in services, it doesn't mean there has to be competition in infrastructure, but it's a matter of how far up the stack do you call it infrastructure, right? Is it conduits and poles? Okay, we can get there. Is it fiber? Mm, you know, places have made it work better than we have. Uh, in the U.S., it would be Hawaii. I mean, the U.S. I don't know. It's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this. Uh, this. You know, in theory, <laughs> if that all sounds you know nice and, and, and sharing and sharing the costs and. But I think you know, it's the logistics of it that's really hard. Okay. Um, if you look at, we're talking about fiber here, and people want to go faster. Okay. Um, you know, Hointel has lots of copper cable, twisted pair, you know, and it's been unbundled, and you know, so that supposedly anybody can use it. And I don't know how much you really, you know, um, lease out of that, but I don't think it's that much. It's not that much yeah. because they're not going after the consumers per se. They're going after the big businesses. So when we see unbundling or dark fiber requirements requests to us, it's more for the big businesses, not the consumers. Yeah, and it's it's you know, that's that's true. And you know, but even for the ones that you know, there there is a little, it's, it's very um, difficult logistically to to manage that. Right? I mean, even the conduits are you know, hard. Take, take it back. Yeah, the, the conduits. Uh, you know, true that Hointel, you know, they manage it. We, if we want to use it, we submit a, you know, a uh, request to use it, and they have to go through and they have to look at it, to, how much space they have. Um, and and the same thing with, you know, on the poles as well. And, and there's actually a number of different uh, parties besides, you know, right. um, uh, point point out, yeah, point electric, they have to look at it, they have to look at the loading, make sure the pole doesn't fall down, make sure it doesn't, you know, um, I mean, it's logistically very difficult. And so I, I think fiber actually would, um, uh, they're, they're technically or, or um, ide idealistically maybe, yeah, it's, it's possible, but, you know, and I think, but it would have to be yeah, it's it's a difficult it's a very, task. It's a very difficult task. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm as I'm watching some of the stuff going on in other countries, they're not necessarily sharing each strand, but you know, it's it's a bundle, and you know, you want to buy two two strands on a route, and you want to buy ten strands on a route. Um, there's somebody who manages that as a utility, um, 
in, in that fashion. But the services then become where the wide open competition that stimulates innovation and everything else, and you're competing on service in a, in a different manner without burdening your service business with the infrastructure business, I guess, would be the ideal way to think of it. But under that model, who's going to make the investment in that, the, that what I call a transmission normal? So Singapore has done a public-private partnership, and Australia is looking at the same thing where it, it's sort of like roads, right? I mean, this is public infrastructure that we all need, but once we build a road, anyone can drive their car on it, anyone can run a trucking business, anyone can run a taxi cab business. It, it, you know, it, it's a different view of telecom and saying, this is an investor-driven infrastructure. It's it's almost going back to the, frankly, it's going back to the 70s and 80s when we, the way we thought about phone systems, at least on the transport layer, but not on the service layer. It's it's really. Anyway. I think you know one of the other issues you have to look at is you probably want to have several providers because again it's a different technology. We can't predict uh, which technology will be able to provide the kind of speeds that you're talking about. It's going to be the. DSL platform, is it going to be cable, is it going to be wireless? Um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I think that's you know, something to consider. The more redundancy you have uh, for, for, for every application, you probably want to have redundancy in case one of the systems does go down. If our system goes down, there's also Ocean and if Ocean goes down, at least that we have our system up. I think the more redundancy you have. That's pretty argumentative, but if you're in the same conduit, it's the same. Toast. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> if we go there and we cut that, yeah, we yeah. backhoe it. Yeah. But which platform would you select as the mm -hmm. not ideal platform? So the U.S. government has opined that DSL and cable modems are not the platforms of the next decade. <laughs> but there's a financial challenge, of course, of getting fiber to every home is beyond the capabilities right now of the current service model. If we expect investors to do it, we're back to exactly what you said, right? Where why would an investor want to make that kind of investment if they have to share it? Sorry, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could provide a uh, specific example, a utopian scenario, and a forward-thinking question. Um, I live in Ava Beach. I use uh, redundant ISPs, uh, both Roadrunner from Oceanic, and I pay thirty-seven fifty a month for my local loop through Hawaiian Tel. I use a separate ISP though, so I hope that I help to finance the infrastructure through Hawaiian Tel with a thirty-seven fifty a, a month. And for the legislators, that was the first two layers. That was the local loop and the next connection that gets me to lava map. So in my community, I. I I pay thirty-seven fifty for for this copper local loop, and it's 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 not exactly competitive, but it's what I do. I live in a reasonably new subdivision called Ocean Point, built by Haseko with underground conduit. Here would have been an ideal scenario as I watched the residential community get built, including new telecom closets. Here would have been a potential opportunity for redundant fiber runs throughout my subdivision. And just as I pay money each month for the people to cut the grass in the common area, I would have been happy to, as a homeowner, have my association deal with bidders to provide and manage my local infrastructure, myself included, because I am far more interested in exporting jobs and video from this island. So should my homeowners association own this fiber that I can compete to manage, I can then potentially produce video that I can then use my backbone to sell to the mainland. So here is a scenario, here are real world numbers, here is a, a lost but still emerging opportunity and the forward thinking question for those of you in this room is what do you do in the EVA plane where D.R. Horton is weighing this they could potentially peer into the DHHL fiber and you could potentially have a fiber backbone in the emerging of a plane that rivals or exceeds anything in the Bay Area where I just spent the last 10 days at Google and at Yahoo and visiting with anyone and everyone I could. 
we're that close. So I would ask the committee to be aware there, that there is that potential, and I am that investor. I am that person who just priced today with the recently emerged um, Time Warner Telecom the cost for five PRIs and 15808 numbers so I can become your next telephone company selling you virtualized PBX solutions which a company in Atlanta seems to be leading us in and I'm about to be all over it but my question is once I rack it how do I route it to your house and that's what's being discussed we're this close to being beyond third world and being on par with Korea with the EVA plane, DHHL, DER Horton, and that Octorone <coughs> Hospital. And I would just, as a citizen who's out here trying to scrap and figure out the landscape and export rather than import, that's, that's the landscape and the reality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I can, we're, um, this is a great, I really want to thank you for your patience. And sorry, <laughs> I don't know if this is what you expected. I do want to let um, Keeman go ahead. Can you guys stick around? That'd be great, thanks. So uh, why don't we let Keeman go, and I think the questions will be similar. Um, and this, yeah, this is, thank you. And so it so should be faster. Maybe I'll just take this minute to welcome Hank Rogers. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Let me see this works. Since I got about nine minutes left. Yeah. Okay. It works. All right. I know why. Okay. So. Um, why it's like this, but <laughs> this is stuff I wanted to talk about, I probably will uh, um, cut short on some of it. It's, um, there's similarities between you know, the things that I was going to present and, uh, and the things that uh, you know, Pointel already talked about. So, okay, uh, I had to put this in for my uh, company. Okay, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> we do cable. We do, you know, we've been doing it since '68, and we yeah. have. Um, really able to provide uh, uh, to 590,000 households <coughs> on all islands. Okay. And this is, this is, um, this is what I, you know, I, we're talking about the goals of what I, you know, what I think the task force is uh, all about. And um, I think uh, Steve talked about it just, just, before this, you know, broadband available. One of the goals I see there's three goals: broadband as many places we can go um, here in Hawaii. One faster down and upstream is what you know what I've been hearing. And then we want lower, of course, uh, you want it at a lower price. And um, so that's three goals, and um, I think that's um, what what everybody's been talking about. Okay, so the first thing is to go to more places. I have the 80-20. The 80-20 is that 80, to get to 80% of the places is going to cost 20% of, you know, 20%. And to get to that last 20% of the, the places in Hawaii, it's going to cost 80%. It's just the way it goes. It's, you know, some places are a lot harder to get to. And so we want to go everywhere. We're going to pay a lot more, of course, for the for those last places. And we also, then, you know, likewise with faster. We have, you know, three, five, seven, 11, 15, you know, we have a lot of different speeds. You want to go to um, 100, you want to go faster, it's going to, of course, cost more. So, you know, one of the questions I think we're, we're asking uh, the presenters before this was you need broadband but everybody's idea of broadband is different and you know what's what's really necessary I think um, uh, it threw out 10 megabit 10 megabit is just you know we say you need 10 megabit do you really need 10 megabit or just that 
you know, that level is, or that you know, um, 10 compared to 100. So, you know, I, I think the more you ask for, the more it's going to cost. That's, that's the main message that uh, um, I think everybody has to understand. Okay, and then I, I believe Steve talked about these goals are, are competing against each other. So in order to go to more places and to make it faster, it's going to cost more. More uh, um, historical <coughs> stuff. We've, we've been doing Roadrunner since '97, and um, actually been doing table modem before that. And David knows all about that stuff since he was uh, he didn't want to give up his old modem before Roadrunner. So. <coughs> And then we've also, you know, we've also increased our speeds over over time because there's uh, a demand for it, and you know, there's a demand for wireless as well. So, okay. This um, represents. Okay. Wanted to see a map, right, of coverage. This is this is a map of coverage. Okay. This is for Representative Ward. Yeah, he's not here. <laughs> you really want to see that? Tell him he missed. I don't know. I just, uh, we have a, a mapping system and uh, it shows all the areas we're covering. Okay. And one, I think one of the things we're all, we don't want to talk about it now, but we probably want to talk about it at another time. Was, mm -hmm. This is a coverage map. What does this tell you? Does this get you, you know, what we wanted? We wanted to say we can cover these areas. Um, I don't think it, you know, gives us what we really want. We want to because we want to know, you know where we're going to cover, where homes we can cover. This doesn't tell you what homes are being covered. This just tells you what part of the island is being covered. <coughs> because there's not, of course, homes on every square inch. So this is uh, just a bigger one of, of Oahu. So, so I think we need to, to work on that. And I, you know, I've talked to Dan about it already. And we'll work on it more to come up with something that's meaningful. For, for the report, at least. Yeah, this, is, this is my um, level diagram. <laughs> a lot simpler. We've got that uh, place in Milani, where, which is our head end with the, our stations. We pull off, uh, pull off um, video from, um, from the satellites. And we use our transport from, from our head end to, to the hub sites. And the telephone poles that um, point tells the telephone poles that we're, we're leasing for the most part because they, they own most of the telephone poles and uh, there are some point electric poles that we lease. I believe we own one pole <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is. That might be why they call them telephone poles. Yeah. <laughs> They're actually utility poles. So, um, so anyway, this, that's, you know, our we get to our hub sites, which are scattered around the island, and then from there, it's fiber from the hub site to um, at the node on the bottom, and to the node, and then from the node it converts to coax, and the coax is what we we provide um, into your house, you know, homes, or even businesses as well. But it's that's the general architecture. Now, what I was really supposed to talk about. The new build process, there's basically two types of um, builds that we have. A new new build, which is new subdivision, and then the existing, which is retrofit. Okay. And a new build, as, as, as Dan said, developers are responsible to get the permits and to, to build the, the conduits, if it's, if it's conduits. Okay. They're, they're required to do that. Um, the same thing goes for condos and MDUs, which are multi-dwelling units. They're all they're required to, and we go through that same process that Dan had talked about, where they're going to get uh, approval, and they they come to us as well, and we we tell them what our specs are if they don't go. Developers 
and there's only a few de you know main developers. They know what to do. They they're very accustomed to knowing what um, what they have to put in, and and so that's actually a pretty good, um, fairly good situation where where you know, they can work that out. Um, condos and MDUs are a little more difficult because it. Um, it's not only roads, and it's not an area where it's turned over actually to you know um, to the uh, the city or, or the state. Um, it's the facility, the conduits, or the risers in a building remain the property of, of the condo or the or the MDU, and and so um, it, it's not quite the same. It's it, they're still responsible at some point for. Permit. So, say they build a new building, they put a, they put conduits up the building. They just put conduit, and then you know, point tell comes or we come in, and we want to pull in our our cable, our coax, or they want to pull in a uh, twisted pair. There needs to actually be a permit for that. It's called a, a low voltage permit, which uh, um, which as we understand it. Buildings responsible to get, but not many of them, you know, not all of them know that. So when we show up and we're going to do work, and um, there's an inspector there, they say they ask us, "Where's the permit?" And so we don't have the permit. We say the building's supposed to get the permit. So, and they don't, they don't get it. They don't have one. So we end up getting it, getting that permit if. Um, if we're asked to get one, basically. So um, I think that the point of this is, you know, the main part of this is that that um, all the contract contractors need to know that they need to do this. If, you know, that's that's a requirement, uh, um, and that is the as we understand the requirement at this point. That that's the main problem with new builds. As far as retrofits, which which are existing buildings where we're going to you know, we're going to go in and put in try and put in service, there's different rules and they, they are, actually have been changing. Um, one of the one of the um, we need permits for that as well, and one of the um, things we struggle with is we have to upgrade. Um, all the facilities up to a certain to the current code. So, so for example, uh, I'll give you a um, uh, example. You're, you're, we want to provide um, road render service to a specific unit, and the, um, the, the coax is running through um, the seating, and that uh, there's there's existing. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> um, coax in the ceiling, but it's the old coax. It's not the coax that's uh, that's uh, you know used for current code. It, it has a different covering, and you know that covering can, um, when there's a fire, it creates toxic fumes. Okay, so instead of just adding on, extending from where it exists now to the end, we have to change the whole thing. We have to change all the all the cabling. And so that, you know, that again adds to the cost. And um, so there's, uh, there's those type of things that, that are new rules that uh, uh, are a challenge to us to get it done one way or another. And that was their, like, their main complaint was they have to go down there with cash or check and they can't ch charge it. Yeah, so this is my my recommendations that are my things for you to consider. Um, you know, the simpler things are, the less you know, the less things we we have to do or hoops we got to jump through. It'll be cheaper. It'll be faster. I, I, you know, I, I don't think we we're going to come out out of this committee with real specific rules or, or you know things we want to get into and change you know change the building permit process or anything like that. But and somehow, if we can get something that says you know, we want, we want to um, encourage broadband. We want to make it faster. We want to make it cheaper. Then we need to try and make it simpler. Simpler, in this case, is better. 
Um, I have the second item, which probably you don't understand, uh, the government, and the government. Um, general interest, not specific interest. I mean, one, of, one of the things we, we find, and you know, I understand why it happens, but if we want to go in and put a cable in a certain um, government facility, and we have to get two conduits, so we have to get their permission, then um, we have to pay a, a fee for it and that, to that specific place. And, and it's to, for them to recover um, their cost to, to, you know, to, that they use to put in the conduits. Um, but everywhere we go, we do that, and, and it would be a lot easier if there was, you know, we pay the, the different fees to, to the DCCA or to the state. If we can kind of like pay once, not to every different entity, because it's, it's not that we don't want to pay, it just takes a long time to determine what, you know, um, what the price is if, if it's not established. And, you know, Gordon's gone a long way to establish a price list, which cuts down on that time frame. But if it's not already established, you have to negotiate it, and that takes a long time. Um, on the corporation side or the private side, fair you know, competition spawns technical innovation. I believe that we, you know, we agree with, with Owen Clell. If we're all you know, able to you know, compete fairly, then the, the technical innovation that we come out with will go will, you know, will, um, will and, and that's where you know, the services and, uh, <coughs> and the cost will, will, you know, cost will decrease and the services will increase. And, and the last last one is for my friend Clyde. Yeah. Um, he's uh, he's called a, he's called a DCCA. He's our regulator, but you know, I, you know not to get him in trouble. Which is, <laughs> he, he does help us. You know, he is like our advocate, and I think that's very important. I think that should be for everything. You know, for the PUC, the the government should be our advocate to try and get some of this stuff done. Not you know think that we're you know we're trying to rip everybody off and you know, we should try and, and help us get get things um, approved and get you know, get it through the whole maze of, of, of uh, approvals and permitting and whatever it is you know I think we if, if we can get an advocate to help us um, get permits to get whatever necessary you know uh, things done I'm not and the same we we're not going to determine, um, you know, whether this is the best thing to do. I mean, this is the best kind of conduit, or it has to be 18 inches, or 24, or 36 inches. I mean, but whatever it is, we would, you know, I think from our standpoint, having somebody in the government helping us, you know, be our advocate to, to get stuff done would, would go a long way to getting getting uh, things done. So. Um, I have to join the bird. Now, this is what my my uh, field guy said. They want to be part of the solution, not the problem. And two minutes. Okay. I was going to start with this, and I was actually thinking that I went to was going to do this because this actually is an example from somebody at Ointel. Yeah. So we have Noah. And Noah in 2008, came, I mean, the Lord came to my mindset. The uh, place is bad again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wipe it out. And so, build me an ark, okay, and save two every living thing and some good humans. Um, and he gave Noah the blueprints and said, okay, you got six months to do this, and before I start the rain. Okay, so six months goes past, and the Lord comes back down, and Noah's weeping, and there's no ark. Yeah. And he yells at Noah, said, where's the ark? And Noah said, forgive me, but things have changed. You now need a building permit. <laughs> so you can build your ark. Yeah. Been arguing with the inspector about sprinklers for the ark. 
They just claim I'm violating the neighborhood zoning. Now I have to, you know, go to the development and appeal board because <laughs> it's too, it's too tall. I have to go to DOT because they want to make sure, you know, I have a bond now. Right. <laughs> and you know, so I can take the, you know, the ark to the, the ocean. <laughs> okay. And then the wood. I need wood for the ark, of course, and. Can't cut down the trees because it's banned. <laughs> so the environmentalists are going to say that you got to save the owls, but you know I'm trying to save the owls too, but <laughs> can't get the wood. And and then the animal rights group, you know, want to stop me from doing stuff. And it's I'm being cruel and inhumane, inhumane, right? EPA. <laughs> okay. Anyway, there's a lot. Okay, human rights commission, immigration and naturalization, checking the green cards, trade unions. You know, he, he was supposed to use his sons, right? Can't do that. And the IRS is saying, I'm trying to import these animals out and you know leave the country. That's illegal. Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take me 10 years now because of all these new rules and uh, so. Right. So, you know, so this sky is clear and no one's thinking, well, it's going to wipe the place out. But this conclusion is no. It was already beaten into it. I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was, I mean, even though it's not. <laughs> Available on the website. <laughs> 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 not that it's, you know, it's a lot of truth in this. So, oh, it's supposed to be a joke. I don't want to offend anybody more than I've already offended them. No. <laughs> I have questions. I do. Oh, boy. I'm sure you're shocked to hear this. Yeah. So. Um, mm. I read on the Kona blog that you guys are doing fiber to the home in a new development. It's the um, Koala Lai. Koala Lai. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so, is that the future? You want to say a little bit about be. that? I mean, that's pretty exciting. That's yeah. the first one in Hawaii, right? Uh, as far as I know, the first one we're doing. Yeah. And um, yeah, right. we did a few last year. We did a few last year. Um, Fort Island has fiber to the pram. Um, Kiola Lai. They did or you did? We did. We oh, did. Uh, yeah, you did that. Yeah, yeah Kiola Lai. Kiola Lai is a fiber to the pram. Yeah. Um, Fort Island is fiber to the pram. All, all the new developments are trying to go fiber to the pram. So, uh, okay. So, both companies would sort of agree fiber to the pram in general. If on you can figure out how to finesse it financially, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's we're, where we're trying it. I, mean, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Necessarily, it's you know, we concluded that it's, you know, the, the, it definitely has you know fiber definitely has advantages over over coax or twisted tear or whatever it is. But we definitely we are trying it. And are you guys in operation with any of yours yet? Mm -hmm. What's the experience so far? Uh, customers on it like it. Um, we, we actually have another one on Maui also, uh, new development there. Um, so one of the things I've read, and you'd be inside this, is it's actually cheaper and easier to manage too. The fiber maintenance is cheaper overall. Um, the electronics up front is costlier, but over time you get you know the cost recovery okay. to the maintenance. And things. And I think you have to see over a period of time as, as things go and. Um, you want more things, and you want to split it off. I mean, fiber is a lot harder to split uh, and then coax at least. Okay. Other questions? Um, yeah. um, just, <coughs> I wish I could say yes. I've solved your problem. Oh. I have <laughs> um, Only if you're doing rewiring in a residential building. The rest of it, you're on your own. Oh. Essentially, a house. You're on your own. Uh, <laughs> we'll work on it. Okay. Um, but it, I think you brought up an interesting point in your discussion when you talked about an, a multi-dwelling units and condominiums. To me, when I look at a condominium, I look at it no different than what Mr. Belford said about a residential community. One's vertical and one's horizontal. There may be more opportunities to create damage, but there isn't that much difference. So if you take Mr. Belford's um, logic and state that you know the association owns the infrastructure, and the association is responsible for the infrastructure, just like they are in a condominium. 
then that seriously should be that shifts the that shifts the shifts the burden and is cer certainly something that should should be considered whether you, how, how how you do it legislation or whatever is something that needs right. to go on the table right. but um, essentially I don't see the difference between a vertical and horizontal. Yeah, is there any reason why we don't have it legislated that every new building or house that goes up needs to have fiber on the last mile? I mean, we just passed a bill saying solar water heaters on every roof of the house. Why can't we do that? It's certainly within scope for us to recommend. And uh, it, obviously the Koreans and the Japanese are making it work. I mean, we can't do it ourselves, maybe we could ask them to do it. <laughs> I like your attitude. Let me give you a reason. Where was that? Yeah. I mean, I, I tried to figure this out. Uh, uh, so, so actually, as best I can tell, and you know, I leave it. You, know, maybe you, you guys have tracked this better than I have. The Japanese and the Koreans sort of never really deregulated. So they went straight from kind of the AT and T world of the eighties to. <coughs> Interpretation. And now that they're deregulating, they're really only deregulating essentially at the services layer. That in general, they don't have every mom and pop digging up the street to pull in fiber, but they do have every mom and pop selling interactive gaming on the fiber that's in there. So they've made it a public priority to get fiber into every premise, essentially one way by hook or by crook. Yeah. Right. Which the U.S. In, as a whole has never done. The U.S. has really, since we deregulated, said, you know, we think competition will result in the right kind of investment. And now we've got all of these companies trying to generate the investment to do the best they can to provide great services and return value to their shareholders. We're being leapfrog. We're being leapfrog. Cool. And so in order for us to yeah, stay competitive as a community, not wide or a nation, I, I, yeah. We I'm trying to explain it, not no, apologize no, no, for it. No, no, yeah. No, no, yeah. No, no, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't, yeah. That, doesn't that say that we have to do something uh, different from the way we've been doing That's why I think we're here. Yeah, we'll we're see here. how far we get. I guess I would just say on the flip side, you know, if, if that was truly the matter and we looked at competition as the answer, then why is there only one video provider in the state of Hawaii? Well, I but, mean, and what I'm saying is that that was something that the YouTube government it. in this infinite vision decided to do. And so, but I mean, have we actually done that? Uh, but, I, but I understand. But I mean, then, then it would be two companies, and then, you know, the price of milk is so levels out somewhere. <laughs> yeah, Aloha and Hawaii and uh, all kind of good stuff. So I, you know. DSL or cable modem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, what I'm saying is if, if we make it a, yeah. a community, or well, I don't know, who, who pays, who puts in the electric last mile when they build a subdivision? Is that the contractor or is that Hawaiian electric? It's the developer, right? Okay, so if it's the developer, make them put in the pipe while they're down there because I think you can safely put a fiber optic pipe next to an electric pipe and they're, they've got a hole in the ground anyway. All at 36 inches. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know the right answer. I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we understand the problem and what we're trying to get to and what might be desirable. I think part of the challenge is that we have um, a complicated set of um, regulations at both the federal and state level, none of which were devised to deploy um, shared infrastructure to premise and provide robust competition for services. I mean, I think everybody in this room, maybe except Keeman, thinks we'd be really well served if there were not just two, but 10 video providers, all of whom were trying to package up services. So well, if you actually, there actually are a lot of video providers, just maybe not for the show you're watching. Yeah, you know, maybe increasingly it's YouTube. Because I was gonna say. Yeah. 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 I mean, so that shit. People shift. downloading movies, yeah. um, you know, the <coughs> Apple TV, the um, Wii Debates, all of those things. I mean, yes. Fair enough. Period. Yeah, I spend more time watching it, video on the internet than I do watching the local television stations. Mm -hmm. Same here. So um, I do want to finish by 4.30. <laughs> yeah, That's so I, I want to leave um, five minutes. We'll do our business real quickly. We've got minutes to approve, et cetera. 
Um, but this has just been probably the best conversation we've had in our existence. So I don't want to cut it any shorter than well. maybe about five minutes. Of I got a quick question. You know, you, when you bought um, access and you showed that map and then you talked about the daily 20 rules, um, does the last 20, does the 80 20 rule apply to that also? Meaning, the last 4% is 64% of the cost. You're saying the last 20 percent is 80 percent of your cost, right? right? Okay. So the, does the 80 80 20 rule apply to the last 20 percent? So 20 uh, percent of 20 is 4 percent. So the last 4 yeah. percent, the rule, rule, rule places, is that 64 percent of your cost? Yeah, probably. That's probably the case. You know, it, it, it's like, and we're looking at. Um, uh, well, we got this request to provide uh, um, some kind of connection for um, cell phone companies. I think one was, and you know, and lots of you know, cell phone companies, uh, cell sites all over the place in town. And, well, there's one, there's a cell site that's like 23 miles <laughs> off somewhere, you know, in the middle of I think a big island somewhere. And, you know, how long, how much money it costs to, to get 23 miles. I mean, it's, it's, it's things like that. It's, there's, that getting to that last place is really tough. Yeah, you know, but isn't, isn't it like a higher priority to get, you know, when, you, when I look at the coverage that you have now, and even if you say there's, this, there's a subset of that, isn't it, isn't it more important to have pockets where, like that first 20%, I mean, the first 80% that they cost 20, if, if we covered that, we would have an industry. It would be a fundamental change. And, and you know, if somebody likes to be, uh, you know, in, within a high-speed connection, then they should move within <laughs> within distance of a, of a fat pipe. We, we, we tried to use uh, language that's a little softer. <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of a uh, rising tide raises all boats. The idea being that if we had, for example, gigabit connections all through, you know, Honolulu, Kahului, you know, Kihei, then we're going to sort of raise everything up. So um, single-digit megabit speeds in Hana wouldn't seem so outrageous. You know, for example, we, we're, we'll raise the whole thing rather than sort of argue about we can't do it here until, you know, we can do something everywhere. I spent four days. Of a week in Honolulu, and I enjoy cable TV and so on. And then I go to the Big Island. I have no cable. I'm far away from cable, and so I, I don't watch TV. And it's a blessing. So, that's for me. What was that? And by the way, that's why Hawaiian Telecom has a franchise. So, so I, you know, I think it's a lifestyle choice. And I think we should let people make a lifestyle choice. And we shouldn't, as a state, stay in the dark ages yes. so that we, you know, we have because we, we can't cover somebody at kind of point. We have a landline, you know, whatever it is. Keep the country country. Keep, Keep the country country. country. Mm -hmm. I like that. Right, so I just, yeah. One closing question. Has the, has the committee or the state examined uh, WiMAX or wireless broadband technologies? It's Our first presentation was Clearwire. So we're one of a, we're a Clearwire pre WiMAX site, and they plan to roll out here. Excellent, excellent. I work with uh, Pacific Wireless Communications, and we work with Motorola, Alcatel, Lucent, and a lot of uh, vendors and manufacturers of wireless broadband equipment. And so we're we're reading about it all the time being yeah. deployed. But I was curious if the task yeah. force and if you have a one, you have a Clearwire. Yeah, so we have Clearwire. Yeah. David, I talked to uh, Oscar earlier yeah. this week, and he thought. Maybe somewhere around after the first quarter of 2009 that this may get converted. Yeah. He wasn't really sure. He thought that might be the time. Yeah, we have a bunch of their boxes at the end. So is Clearwire going to make these guys obsolete? No, they're not. Cable or? <laughs> it's wired and wireless, not wired versus wireless. Like, I'm just saying, you get it. So. Oh, we're gonna work I mean, that'd be the hard thing to do is, is <laughs> yeah. put in all the wire and find out that wireless is just yeah. not So the point is, we can't, we can't beat the speed of the hardware. Okay.
Well, thanks. This was great.